<laughs> I knew where you were going. I knew you, where you were going with that one. Uh, Hi. Cheers. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm so sorry I missed last week, and I'm very glad to be back this week. Well, this week is kind of, but this is like the most, well, it might not be the most important work, but there's a sourdough revolution happening right now. And since people are isolated at home, they're tending to these cultures. A lot of people are doing it, they think, badly. My friend kept texting me, and she was starting one. And for weeks, she was going, does this look right? I'm like, no. And so she kept regular feeding. And then finally, yesterday, I said, what is the flour using? And she said, the, the bag said baker's flour. Yeah. I'm like, OK. I said, is it bleached? Uh, and she said, yes. And I'm like, kid. No. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a chance. Bad start. So yeah. those, those kinds of questions we will be answering. If you have questions about sourdough, we are here for you because this is the sourdough episode. And Jeffrey, you're going to be making... We're going to make Vermont sourdough. Um, and it's called Vermont sourdough because we're in Vermont and because all of the many, many billions of microorganisms that are going to go into the bread have been registered as being Vermont residents, so we can be sure it's truly <laughs> Vermont sourdough. Let's go. And we've named this one Herbert, without your permission. Oh, that I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Do you have problems with Herbert? <laughs> what so, are the ingredients? They're very simple. We're going to have water, uh, two types of flour, an unbleached all-purpose flour, and a whole rye flour and salt and mature sourdough culture. I'm going to begin the mix using this mixer, but only until the ingredients come together, and then there's going to be a rest period for, we'll only do about 15 minutes in class, but typically you do it for 20 minutes to about 60 minutes. The fancy word for that is autolyse or repo autolyse. It's a method of giving the dough a chance to rest once the ingredients have become what's called hydrated and during that rest phase there's this kind of miraculous development of gluten bonds even in the absence of mechanical agitation and if if you want to follow the recipe there is a link in, in the description of the show so you can actually click on that link so you can see exactly the proportions that jeffrey's working yeah with. and we're making a single batch right yeah we're doing oh wait a minute i'm so glad i looked at this Ooh. We're doing a single, not a double, so we don't need all that water. We need 435, so I'm going to pour some of this back. So that was three, about 400 in the smaller one, if you remember which one's which. Let's see, milliliters. And what you're doing now is essentially a starter with your starter. So this is going to get things going in, in the bread. And you are, this is where you add your Levant or your sourdough starter. Mm -hmm. This is where it starts yeah, entering the recipe. Um, and how, what would you suggest week-wise, like how many weeks does it usually take if somebody's just started their to starter? To make a sourdough? I say about eight days, and it's got kind of an early maturity. Here's a close-up. This sourdough isn't as bubbly as it looked when I left my home. We're doing this in Gazina's kitchen. You can see a number of bubbles on the surface, but it was much more bubbly. And due to the condition of the Vermont roads, um, a lot of those bubbles. <laughs> <They burst. laughs> and what time did you feed? This was fed, uh, I fed this late yesterday evening. So it's been, I like it to go about 14 to 16 hours for ripeness. That can be, there's so many ways you can vary that though. And I think we don't want to get too far along with that kind of discussion right, right now. But you did have to get it to ripeness in order for it to be ready today right. to bake. So, yeah. And so we'll the, talk more about that in yeah, a little bit. The mother culture goes back to 1999, um, and it's been fed daily since then. And is that just all-purpose flour? This is the all-purpose and the whole rye. Unbleached? And salt. Unbleached, yeah. Yep. So. And then, and the other thing to note, it's just the water, the starter that is ripened, and flour, nothing else yet. Specifically, no, no salt. 
Now this, I actually did put the salt in. It's Never also mind. another kind of, no, it's another one of these kind of technical scientific reasons why you would not put the salt right. in at this phase, but I don't want to make things really complicated. I want right. to try to simplify the process because a lot of the people who are watching this presumably have that five pound bag of flour and they don't quite know what to do with it yet. Right. And hopefully they've got a starter that they have named and are, are nurturing it. Now, if somebody had started, because your Levant starts with a kickstart, I call it, of rye, and then yeah. it transitions to just yeah. the feeding, to just the all-purpose. If someone finds that their, their starter is a little <coughs> lackluster, would there be, would it be wise to maybe add a little rye to get it yep. kick-started again? Yep. Yeah, basically, it's very common to see a starter that winds up being 100% white, like this one, right. begun with 100% rye. Why? Mm -hmm. Because there's so much more nutrition from the bran and the germ of the whole right. rye, so it's a good way to get things kicked off. Often you'll see a little bit of honey added at the same time right. for the same reason, um, and then it gradually becomes all white. And what are you looking for here? Just to, Just to hydrate rough, the flour and then make mix? sure that the consistency is right. If I need to add a little bit of water, I'll do that. But I'm just basically trying to bring the ingredients together so there's no little lumps of flour. Now, I think it's really interesting to, to note that when you look at these formulas, the percentage of sa sourdough seems so tiny. You mean the, the percentage of the overall flour that's sour? Well, no, the, well, no, of the actual Levant that you put into the mix. You know what I mean? There's, it, a lot of people would think, oh, you have to add at least a cup's worth for this to work. Do you mean the sourdough that went into the here culture. to generate yes. this ripe one? Yeah, no, generally 5 to 10 percent should be plenty. And that's a percentage, 5 to 10 percent percentage to flour. To flour, exactly, right. yeah. And then that's one of those things that's interesting about baking. When you are a professional baker and you work in, pr in production baking, you don't have recipes like you're used to for home baking. What you do is you have a formula and it will be based upon the flour. So the flour always counts as 100%. That's right. And every other ingredient is a percentage thereof. So Correct. that's, you know, if you want to learn fractions, if you want to teach your kid fractions, I think Baker's math is a great way to do it because you get something delicious out of the math, which is so cool. Mm. So now you've got your initial okay. mix. So can we look here, please, Ray? So this is simply hydrating the flour. And again, if you look, if you were here on the first week when we made a simple white dough, it was the same thing. We just hydrated the flour. There's no structure. There's no strength. There's no gluten development here. Um, the miracle happens now, even in this rest period, without any agitation from a mixer, the gluten bonds will develop. And we'll see that in about 15 minutes when we tug on it and we'll see that instead of just shredding apart like that, it's actually got some structure. This is a way that we can simplify our workload. We yeah. don't have to mix this for 20 minutes by hand right now. Right. It can just sit and do some work right. while you get other things done. And it on behalf of people who maybe do have that bag of flour but don't have a mixer, the rest of this mixing I'm going to do by hand. Right. Just so that people can see that you don't need a lot of fancy equipment. You know, we've got nice, beautiful banetons here. You don't need You it. can use a glass or a steel bowl with mm -hmm. a tea towel in it so that you can make really, really good bread without an enormous outlay of money. Yeah. And we'll really focus on a lot of those methods. And the ingredients, now it's not so easy to find flour, but it is one of the less expensive things. And it's, to me, bread baking is a, is a pretty decent hobby in that what you get from it is just tremendous versus the cash outlay. I mean, you can get fancy things like a mixer, but really if you've got a bench and some big bowls, you're, you're pretty much ready to rumble. And Jeffrey is and you now- And one of these. And one of those, bowl scrapers. Bowl and bench scrapers really are- right. That's about all you need. You don't need a lot. Some of the most well-used tools in the baker's little pocket. And I, me, because I do a lot of pastry, a lot of offset spatulas. Yeah. <laughs> I have an inordinate amount of small offset spatulas. 
So that is going to now hydrate and rest. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important that we also discuss um, what it means to be ripe. Yeah. If you're a sourdough, what it means to be unfed and what is discard. And I think one okay. thing that's interesting and actually upsets people when they first start with sourdough is that once you have a mature culture, you end up discarding quite a bit of it and it feels wasteful because you're like, I've spent all this time doing this. Why am I throwing it away? Mm -hmm. So discuss. Okay, so what happens? You add water to flour and you awaken all kinds of latent potential in the flour. The flour is inert until we, the baker, comes, comes along and does something with it. So once you add water to flour, you're waking up all these enzymes. There's all kinds of different things going on on a kind of subatomic level. Um, and if you use good flour and good water, you don't want chlorinated water, which is going to impede the development of yeasts, then what you're gradually going to do with good flour, good water, and a good feeding regimen at a good temperature, um, you'll start developing the different microorganisms that go into sourdough. What do we want our sourdough breads to do? We want them to provide sour flavor. These come primarily from lactobacilli, various different strains of lactobacilli. And we want our sourdough to provide leavening. So this bread has no commercial yeast in it, but it leavened pretty well simply from the sourdough. Um, it's a gradual evolution between that first addition of water to flour until you wind up with mature sourdough culture because different species take up residence in your little mm -hmm. bowl. There's different types of lactobacilli that aren't that favorable that come along after a couple of days. But as the pH goes down, meaning the acidity increases, those early on, not such good guys, they can't live in that more acidic environment, and so they are gone. And then different types of first homo fermentative bacteria come along, they produce lactic acid, and then a few days later, hetero fermentative bacteria come along, they produce both lactic and acetic acid. Now you're getting some more complexity. Now you're getting more aromas, yeah. more flavor, the yeasts are developed, and then with good steady regimen of feeding, in roughly a week, I usually go eight days, you'll have sourdough that I would call like a teenager. It's mm -hmm. vigorous, it's ready to go, and as long as you maintain it reasonably well, it should be able to make bread for you for, well, <clears throat> the first sourdough I made was on August 28th, 1980. That was rye flour and water. Uh, my first boss was a German woman, and when I was leaving my first job after five years, she said, do you want me to show you how to make a German-style rye sourdough? And I said, I think there will be some sourdough in my future. So <laughs> yeah. It's magical. It, and it so really, that one will turn 40 in yeah. August. It'll turn 40 years old. <laughs> That's so and I feed that every morning. Now, and I have a question. So the feeding schedule, so you feed once a day? Yes. And so you, do you usually feed in the morning? I usually feed the cat, feed the sourdough, feed the human. Their That's priorities. The order of Those are the priorities because the cat, the cat will complain. But you fed this last night in order yeah. to get it ready and ripe right. for baking right. today. Right. And so that is the question: that how do you know when you see the, a recipe that says use ripe sourdough? Yeah. yeah. What does that mean to the person who has a sourdough starter ready to go? They want to know, do I feed it and then use it? Do I feed it, give it? And you said you like yours to have about 14 hours? Yeah, but see, everything is variable. So, for example, if I wanted, this is ready to go. We're going to have to okay. morph over to this. If I wanted it to be ready earlier, for this one, I used 10% um, of the flour weight was mature culture. Okay. Okay? If I wanted it ready in fewer hours, if I did 20% mature culture, I've got twice as many microorganisms. Right, right? doing so you, harder are, work, got it. Right, yeah. so there's all those kinds of variables. So how about we load the oval first? Okay, we're gonna load the oval first. This is a peel, it's pretty humdrum as you can tell. Not very expensive piece of equipment, is it? It's an old bottom to a drawer. Uh, th yeah, that's right? so great though. Uh, and here we have this. Cornmeal? Uh, it's actually um, 
semolina, but semolina. cornmeal would work. If it's full fat cornmeal, sometimes it tends to burn a little bit. Release thyself. Well, and then there is that upset with the discard. When you feed, you have to get rid of some. So I, we're going to show you what to do with that discard. At least one thing. Yeah. That is beautiful. And what we're going to do is load it into a, a vessel that is going to retain the heat. It also has a lid. So this one is very specific to, to fancy to baking, but you can use, uh, if it's not an oval, a Dutch oven is great. And here's the sky. That works. Oh, come on, get in there, sir. Okay. Are we putting the lid on? I'm putting the lid on. This is preheated. So that is super hot. And then I'll get the round. And that is 17 hours. And the oven is at around 450 to 460. It's a really hot oven. Uh, and what this does when you have the lid on, it creates a ersatz steam environment that professional ovens have. So there's like literally steam that will go into a professional oven that will allow for that beautiful crust. And then we, we're doing this a little backwards so we can show you the whole process. It's not necessarily in order. And you have that on parchment there because it's easier to mm -hmm. hopefully load and unload. Yep. And now he's scoring using a lamb. And that allows for the bread to have a gorgeous it'll give us it'll give it an opportunity to expand throughout those cuts in so now it's they're going to be lidded i usually go for about a half hour do you want to put more. a timer on or just i'm gonna put a timer okay. on as long as it because otherwise i'll forget so we loaded the bread we have auto lees going on over there. We talked a little bit about the sourdough culture and what it means to be ripe when it's ready to use the feeding regimen. In that feeding regimen, there's a discard. That means you get rid of a, a pretty large percentage of the starter and then you feed what's left. I'm going to be making something in a little bit that uses that discard so it makes you feel a little more secure about that starter not going to waste. Mm, okay. We're not going to give this a full 20 minutes. We're going to take it out now only because we have time constraints. So I will do, now I'll do hand mixing. So you have everything, in this case, you put everything that is in the dough recipe That's going. Right. It's, it's all, all in, in there. there. So you, yep. didn't, you didn't start with the starter. You just put it all in there, which is, which is so lovely. Like, they're in the, look at that. That's that, just in 10 minutes. And before it was shredded when right. you would do that. That's, uh, I love that. So now I'm going to start a mixing process, which is very, very French, and it's very effective too. And it's probably different than the way most of us were taught by our grandmothers, if we were at all. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to point my thumbs either this wall or this wall. I'll choose this wall. And I, my, fingers, my fingers go under the loaf. My thumbs point to the wall. And then I rotate up to the top. And then I lay it on its back and flip it over. Repeat. Point to the same wall, rotate the thumbs up, lay it on its back, and I keep doing that. And the reason why this is effective is for two primary reasons. One is because by always rotating, always pointing to the same wall, it means I'm working up 25% of the loaf. So after right. four strokes, I've worked up the entire mass. And you can see that I've barely touched this, but already it's looking pretty dough-like, right? By no means is it finished mixing, but you can see that it's starting to come together. It, it's get, it, yes, it is. You can tell that the, those gluten bonds are, are starting to exactly. form because it's, it's fighting back. You know, this is how I learned to mix by hand. Yeah. Because of strudel dough. Uh-huh. This is going to fall off. <laughs> Stay. So strudel dough, I call it the dough of 100 wax. Yeah. <laughs> And it's really loud and fun. Yep. I love doing that with my Omi. Okay, so 
I can do this for another 10 minutes or so and call it done. Or alternatively, I can simply let it sit again and rest some more and come back to it in 20 or 30 minutes. Now, typically, I would do this a little bit more if we didn't have the time constraints of one hour. And then I would put a 50-minute timer on, bring it out, and give it another series of folds, another 50-minute timer, another series of folds. And then after the third 50-minute timer, I would divide it. That means two and a half hours of bulk fermentation. You could go three if you wish. Two and a half is adequate to make good bread, but you can go a little bit more if you like. But in order for us to keep going, I'm going to leave this as is. We'll come back to it later. Now we're going to divide and pre-shape. Now we're going to divide and pre-shape. So there was a dough that I already, that we've already prepared that has, you know, I actually put it in the fridge for quite a long time. And that is another alternative, right? Yes, there's three ways you can approach this dough. One way would be the following. You have your ripe sourdough, and you mix the dough, let's say, in the morning. You give it the two and a half hours of bulk fermentation, and then you divide it, shape it, proof it, and bake it. That would be like a straight-through process. A second method would be mix your dough, give it one hour, one and a half hours to bulk ferment, and then press the gas out of it and refrigerate the bulk dough overnight. That's what Gazina did. Um, the third method, well then that second method, after you've taken out the dough, you divide it, shape it, proof it, and bake it. The third method is the way that I did it for these loaves, and that was mix it, give it two and a half hours of bulk, divide it, pre-shape it, shape it, refrigerate it overnight, shape. Shaped. Right. Well, and that's, that's the lovely thing about sourdough in that, you know, it, it is forgiving in that giving it that time also develops the flavor. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not in a race to go anywhere, uh, which is why I love it so much. It is forgiving and there's so much flavor in that time. I'd like to say that I almost feel apologetic about doing sourdough so soon into our series. I know we're doing it because all over the country yeah. sourdough seems to be the big theme of the moment so I'm sure there are many people who are glad that we're doing sourdough today but on behalf of people who are at a kind of newer place in their trajectory yeah. um, I want to apologize to them and also say that you know if getting into sourdough it's not really the right time for you to do it yet don't worry about it. The world of yeasted breads is really vast and you can explore that for years and years and years and then down the pike sometime you, you might say, well now I'll get into sourdough. And I think, but I do think a lot of people got into sourdough because they cannot find commercial yeast. Uh-huh. That, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's why a lot of people have jumped into it maybe earlier than they might otherwise yeah. have. And so that leads to a question that somebody had asked and I thought I would save it for today, mm -hmm. in that because commercial yeast is tough to find right now, can you take a, 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 a recipe that uses commercial yeast and swap, it, swap out some sourdough? Yes, you could. Of course, you'll be having a very, very different bread. Right. Um, but you certainly could do that. Um, what, what I would look at is in the sourdough, a certain amount of flour, by the nature, by the definition of sourdough, a certain amount of flour is being acidified prior to the final mix. So in this case of the Vermont sourdough, it's simply 15%. If you wanted to make bread that wasn't sourdough, um, or take a sourdough formula and transfer it to non-sourdough, mm -hmm. you would probably want to start with, well, how much flour was pre-fermented with sourdough? What I'll do is I'll pre-ferment that amount of flour with commercial yeast, and I'll either make a liquid one like we did here, which mm -hmm. would be called a pouliche, or you might make a firm one, which could be called a biga or a pat fermenté. So this is 270 grams, mm -hmm. so I'm going to divide it into, what, about 67 grams? More rolls? And do, no, I'll just add it on to these. Oh, you're going to add on to the other ones? That's exciting. Well, I, I am thrilled 
that there are so many people who are finding solace in baking. And I think there is something very nurturing about sourdough because you do have to tend to it every day. So this is the pre-shape. This is the pre-shape. I don't have to be too vigorous because it's not a final shape. The final shape will take more vigor. So I'm folding it in half more or less away from me. Then I'll pick it up so that the seam, which is now horizontal, will be vertical. And then I'm going to lay it on its kind of tailbone and then tuck while I roll it back towards me. Move around about a third of the loaf, repeat, repeat and then just give it a gentle rounding. One thing that's important in every single phase of bread making, whatever kind of bread you're making, and that is that you don't want to rip the dough. If you rip the dough, it's an indication either that you're being too kind of aggressive or your hands aren't dry. And one of the things that's really easy to do is just run your hands onto a little flour so that they're dry. If your hands aren't dry, the tendency is to rip the surface of the loaf. That surface is going to be kind of the viewing surface after the bake, and it'll be somewhat of a defect. So just be careful. Even if you're almost done and you feel it sticking, just go like that and then finish. And I, I, I feel as if you're being relatively gentle. You're not doing a vigorous degassing. Nope. Am I correct? No. Nope. If I needed to bring a lot of strength into the dough because it felt weak, I'd be putting more exertion into it. But this dough has plenty of strength from that overnight fermentation. Right. Time develops strength. Mm -hmm. And acidity also contributes to strength. So this dough has a lot of natural strength to it. It's magic. So while that rests, because it needs to relax a bit before we can go to this the final need, Since it's so cold, this will need to relax for at least 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that gives me some time to make some crumpets. I think it's crumpet I think time. I some crumpets. And I promise you that for those who have a sourdough, especially when you're first starting, if, you, if you've been dealing with a Levant for many years, discard, schmiscard, you're like getting rid of it. You're just getting it fed. But there are some recipes that use the discard i.e. unfed. It isn't going to be something that leavens the bread beautifully, but you can still use it to give it a little oomph and wonderful flavor. And one of those things that I love so much are sourdough crumpets. And I've been feeding Ray sourdough crumpets now for a couple weeks, and he's happy. I'm happy. And they're incredibly simple. So what I have here is just a cup of discard. Um, now, some people keep their sourdough in the fridge, so you could, if you feed it at least once a week, please, um, you could, if it's been fed once a week, you could use it um, from the fridge. -y. I usually like to get a little room temperature. Uh, or if it's the discard for the day, if you're leaving it out and feeding it every day, this is a cup, which is quite a bit, so you can actually start collecting discard until you have enough for crumpets, so why not? To that, and I'm not adding any extra flour, I have half a teaspoon of salt and a whole teaspoon of sugar. And if you look at the description on this video at the top, the links to the recipes are right there so you can follow along. So everything that Jeffrey's been doing, it's right there. Everything that I'm doing right now is right there. Now, to this, I'm going to be adding some baking soda. And if you were paying attention, to what Jeffrey was saying, he was saying that there's a little acid in there, right? And you need acid for baking soda to have any efficacy. So baking soda differs from baking powder in that baking powder has added acids, sometimes it has some cornstarch in there, that it works on its own. But baking soda needs an acid to make it work. And it's already living, it's residing inside that sourdough. So it's sour, right? That's all meaning. So I'm going to add that, but wait, hot griddle, muffin rings. If, if you're like me, so I actually went out and got muffin rings, but in the past I have used, and don't tell anybody, cat food cat cans. Food can. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> cat food cans, and you take off the top and the bottom. <laughs> of course, you clean them, the whiskers or the friskies off, but they work too. They're usually a little smaller than a traditional muffin ring. 
So you could make five, but this recipe makes four. This griddle has been preheating. The rings are also preheated, and I find it's really crucial that you do all this at once. If you spray and let it sit too long, the spray will just pool at the bottom mm. and, and the rings won't be nonstick. So I have everything ready to go. The baking soda starts working right away. So I want to be in a position to mix it all up. This is not your normal looking dough, is it? That's all there is. Too. That's all it is. No you salt? You're not any I did. Salt? I you added did. half a teaspoon and a uh -huh. teaspoon of sugar. And so now it's going to start bubbling. And, and baking soda, it's not like baking powder, which you'll see on the, the container. It says like double action and all that fun stuff. It, meaning that it will start working the second you start putting it in. And then it'll wait and do more action in the oven. Do this starts working with. Do Thank you. Spritz? Yes, I have to spritz now. Thank goodness you're here. I'm using avocado spray because I love avocados. <laughs> but you can use anything. But what I really want to make sure is that I get to the sides. Boop. And you can put a little butter at the bottom too. And that oh, will yeah, give a to that, lovely right? flavor. Look at that gloopiness. And I usually take a little time to let it spread out because it sets relatively quickly. And you'll probably wonder why I have the rings so close together. And it's because I want the top to set relatively quickly. And what I have is a little bowl here that I will put over all the rings so that that heat and steam from that covered bowl will start setting the tops of the crumpets at the same time, making this will you much flip faster. Do you flip and then them? I will flip it, yes, uh -huh. once they have set a bit. I Because I actually like you, sometimes you don't have to, that's a little. It wasn't totally even, but that's okay. This will be done faster than the others. And it will rise to the top of the ring. So I'm going to cover that for a little cool. bit. And how long do they cook now? So they cook for usually five minutes on the one side. Yeah. And then you flip them over um, and maybe two or three minutes more. And this is what they get these lovely, lovely holes like wow. English muffins. And I make breakfast sandwiches from them. But I wanted to show you something because this is going to take a few minutes. Okay, these are my hen's eggs. But I wanted to show you something special that happens in the springtime. <laughs> My mama goose starts laying. So, Jeffrey, this is for you. Oh, aren't you sweet? I'll tell you, those duck eggs that you gave us, oh my gosh. They're, yeah, like, they're, they're so special. creamy. Even the whites are creamy. They have more protein. So that's what's my favorite poaching egg because the albumin just seizes immediately and makes that perfect poached egg. They're gorgeous. They have so much protein. The yolks, I don't know if you know, are huge. Oh my gosh, they're, they're huge. really big. Right, and uh, psychedelic colors. Yeah, well, because they're free range, so yeah. they're eating all the good yeah. critters out there oh that gosh, make yeah. make for wonderful thank colors. Thank you for this. You are welcome. Ma, ma, you have to thank Mama, not me. Okay, I'm gonna lift this. This is always a trick. Hey, oh, I flip that over. Didn't mean to do that. Well, now you can see it's already browning underneath. And you can see the bubbles starting to form on the very top. And what you're looking for is to see more perceptible bubbles, not unlike pancakes, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And then you also want that to start looking opaque. Oh, because okay, that means, shiny. So you see how that flipped over and it started running because I was being a little hasty with my flipping. But you don't want this to, to start running when you flip it. I see. If that makes sense. Sure, you can see here it's setting up really it's nicely. It's setting up over right? there because that's the one that had uneven batter and it's also, you know, it has a little less than these guys. Mm -hmm. But you can see it reaching the top. Mm -hmm. And by the time it gets opaque, then it is flippable. And I wasn't able to get to the live feed to see questions, but I don't know if Ray can see any questions in life. I'm going to see. Oh, he's working here? But if you have any questions, I'm going to see if I can find the feed. I know, this is like technology. Can I see some questions while these bake? Questions, questions, questions. Oh, here we are. No, that's an old video. We've done so many already. <laughs> oh well, I'll make up questions. But uh, anything else that you want to tell people about the process of keeping a starter, of, you know, what is your take on refrigeration? Um, 
Okay, let's talk about that. And I want to look at it from two perspectives. I, I spent 40 years as a professional baker, so the reality there is going to be different than a home baker. And I understand it's a huge challenge to commit to feeding a culture seven days a week if you're only baking once a week. So the way I do things wouldn't necessarily work for other people. I don't mind feeding my culture. It's very small. It's 10 grams of the mature culture, 20 grams of flour, 17 grams of water. So it takes me three and a half minutes to do it, and I don't mind doing it. And yes, there's culture that I throw away every morning, but I don't look at it as waste. I look at it as it's changing its job description. Right. So it's going into the compost, basically, or being repurposed. That is true. You can compost. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's so it isn't wasted, and it break it breaks down incredibly fast. Well, and it must be adding all kinds of good stuff into the microorganisms. All the yeah, all right? the bacteria. And how do you feel about uh, uh, Levin hotels? Um, well, they're <laughs> not really it. necessary. There's ways that you can, if you're going to go away for a while, there's ways that you can put your culture into long-term storage so that you kind of preserve its DNA so that when you come back, um, it's basically the same thing. So basically you're putting it on an extended nap. So how do you do that? It, uh, with a rye culture, you just oh, add really? about 10 times more rye flour than there is culture. So if you start yeah. with 10 grams of culture, you're going to add roughly 100 grams of rye. Those are beautiful. Yeah, but ah, oh, the one is sticking. Here. How dare you? Are you going to use your asbestos? I got it. I can do it. That, that, you want a knife? Oh my gosh, you've got a you knife got in your yeah. I got it. I got it. I think I got it. Good. I got That's it. Good. Yeah. That's beautiful color. See, this is what I mean about when you spray it. You have to spray it almost immediately before you put in the batter. Otherwise, the rings are so hot that it just slides down and pools at the very bottom instead of becoming mm -hmm. nonstick. So you have to kind of be Johnny on the spot. But that really is the hardest part of doing this, that the timing it's so zippy. That one's already done. Because um, that one had a little less batter. But there are sourdough hotels. There are, yeah. there are places, kind of like when you put your dog for boarding, mm -hmm. you can board your sourdough so that there's somebody tending to it. And I wonder if they have cameras in those <laughs> hotels like they do for, for dog boarding. <laughs> so you can make sure they're taking good care. They're taking good care of your beautiful... Starter. But again, it's not necessary. You can take a liquid levain like we used for the um, the bread, yeah. and you use an offset palette knife. You said you've got dozens of them. Yes, I do. And you spread it really thin onto a piece of parchment paper. Leave it sit out for a day or two. And you dry it. You dry it, mm -hmm. and then you crumble it up, put it in an old sock after you wash it or something cotton. Wash that sock first, and though it probably has some lovely bacteria <laughs> in it too. <laughs> And then you're perpetuating, you're preserving the DNA. Right. You're putting it on suspended animation. It's also a great way to uh, share starter as well. Yeah, yeah. So here are our lovely crumpets. Uh, this is my favorite one right there. That's beautiful, right? That's the nature of doing things on the spot. And what's the shelf life for these, Gazina? Well, I will, if I'm making many, because this, this recipe only makes four, so the shelf life is usually 10 minutes after yeah. making. <laughs> However, they freeze beautifully. They do. And if I freeze them, what I do first is I will split them mm -hmm. and then freeze them. Mm -hmm. And then refresh them in, the, in a 350 oven and they only take about four or five minutes. And to you be don't ready separate to... them. You, they're split, but they go in to the No, oven. I don't separate them yeah. because once they're in the oven, I refresh them together and then they immediately yep. come apart. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that. Th those are crumpets done. So in a way, it's better to make a bigger batch and freeze them. So yeah, but the thing is with the discard, if you're using discard, it's just such a lovely thing that if you can plan ahead, then you can have um, this really beautiful, fresh, right, bread from your sourdough that has some of that lovely flavor that goes into something that takes much longer. But yeah. also, if you have any, you know, awful feeling about throwing away the discard, but if you have a compost pile, put it in there, um, then it, this is a lovely way to use it. Oh, that looks beautiful. Just leave it there. That's fine. And the way I usually split 
You can just put it, you can put it on your, your oh, no. look at that. Can you get in closer, Ray Ray? Watch out for that. That's iron. Beautiful. And so you take the lid off and then we continue baking. And you can see how beautifully it's expanded because that lid, and they're really thick, they're cast iron, traps, it's essentially a steam environment. And there are other things, you can, there are some ceramic clushes that create the same, actually not as efficient. Or you could use a Dutch oven, which works beautifully. The only problem is, is that instead of putting it into a relatively flat surface, you have to put your, you ha yep. actually have to drop the bread in there, or you, ha you know, you have to put your hands in there, which is, you can burn your hands. Uh, so if you have something like this, the clush, I don't know where I put the clush, but it's a flat bottom, very much like this. I like this setup a lot because the heat transfer is perfect. Right, and I like the fact that you're loading it onto the lid instead of dropping yes. it in. Because uh, when I do it, this one isn't too deep, but normal Dutch ovens usually are deeper. Yeah. I usually wind up distorting the loaf. You distort it yeah. and you just drop it from a height that you, uh, that's yeah. not fun. This was, I think, about 40 bucks. So if you bake a lot of bread, it pays for itself pretty quickly. Yeah, it does. And it's just, it's one of those things that even with the Dutch oven, some of the, the, li the lids have um, plastic knobs on top. Oh, yeah. And you have to take the plastic yeah. knob off. And that's then right. I've done that before where I've put like tin foil to stop up that little hole. Um, so now, do you think we're rested enough to start shaping? I just checked them, and why did I think not? If you look here... Oh, let's see. Why, why is that not ready? Because they were so cold, they're a little right. resistant to relaxing, so I, they'll want another 10 minutes, I think, anyway. I want to finish talking about long-term storage of cultures. Yes, so please. If you have a liquid levain like we used in the bread, you would just spread it thin, as I said, dry it out, and then crumble it up. For rye, if you start with 20 grams of mature culture, you'd add about 200 grams of rye flour. And take your time. It'll take you 10 minutes, but it's very enjoyable 10 minutes. And you just rub the flour into the culture until you get a somewhat coarse meal. Um, and then that also you just put into some cotton vessel and leave it out at room temperature. Don't refrigerate it because it's too humid and it could get moldy and don't leave it in something like plastic or it will get moldy. If you keep a firm textured sourdough, the easiest way if you want to leave it for, if you're gone for say three or four weeks, you simply give it a build, make it a little firmer than you typically do and then after one hour refrigerate it. And what happens during that hour is Yeast always develops before acidity, so during that hour, you're giving the yeast a chance to get a little bit of a start. Then you're refrigerating it, and the yeast has access to plenty of food, and it won't be in a very highly acidic environment, which would not be good for it. What are you doing over here? Why? <laughs> I am making, where, where were my, oh, I brought them over here. Wow. I'm going to make a little sandwich. I'm being a little crazy. Oh gosh. What are you cooking on? I'm cooking, you know what this is? <laughs> I, I don't have a plug and griddle, but I did a long time ago, like many of us do. This is a crepe griddle. Oh, sure, sure. And I thought, I need this badly, and it, I never took it out of the box. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I need something that I can plug in because I don't have a flame here to do this. And I'm like, oh, I've got something. I have my. I Look have this. So this is my little uh, breakfast sandwich, and this is, of course, cheddar, local-ish. Wow. So right, and I put that on to melt. I'm going to fold that over. Only one guy that. gets cheddar? Oh, and then you fold the whole thing over? And then... Oh, my goodness. Like that. X marks the spot. Oh, get in there. There we go. Oh Big Sammy. Oh, my gosh. Breakfast of champions. And they said all the restaurants were closed. I know. Come on. You can do this at home. No, but what this is is just it, it behaves just like a plug and griddle. Yeah. And um, in the recipe, it says if you have one of those 300 or medium heat is the perfect heat. So I just put it in the middle for a Breton crepe. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's what I did. Wow. And I think, but that's one of those things about I didn't want to run out and 
buy something new. Yeah. And as most people do who are interested in food and get a little too, uh, their eyes are too wide, you tend to get things that you think you'll use a million and one times and you never do. And well, I thought, you got a well, great now, use for it. I, and I could use other things that I have. For instance, I have my tart rings mm -hmm. and I use that to contain the eggs because this doesn't have a rim right. and I wanted it about the size of my omelet pan mm -hmm. so that I could contain it and put it correctly in the Brilliant. sandwich. And then I have cheese because we pretty much eat our way through cheese. <laughs> And then I crisscross the bacon so that you have enough, but it's not so big that it's flopping around yeah. and it stays nice and neat. Isn't that great? So, and then it just sits there looking pretty. Or yeah, so you can eat it. you can once you <laughs> once you're if you've been good, and and everything as it's looking good, you get a sandwich, you get a snack. <laughs> okay, so I think what I'll do is I will shape these now. They're still a little bit young. But we'll shape them and then, that's okay. Mm. And then we're going to give another, before the hour is up, another series of folds Great. to our bread, even though that's a little earlier than the timing should now, be. Now, I took this out maybe an hour and a half before you, you came around one, and I took this out of the fridge about an hour and a half before you came. Right. So that's been quite a few hours. So this is actually a, a good lesson as well for those who are thinking about uh, refrigerating the bulk ferment, right? That yeah. they that you do have to wait a little longer yeah. for it just to relax. Yep. It's not that you can't do it, it's just that you can't be hasty about it. And that really is bread and baking. It's that patience. Yep. And I know someone will ask, well how do you know that it's not ready? Also one of those things is you just have to play, you have to work with the dough. And even I think if somebody tried to shape now, it might not be perfect, but they'll still have great bread. It, yes, you'll still have great bread. The one thing to keep in mind too, Gazina, is that if you dedicate yourself to focusing on the effects of your actions mm -hmm. with bread, because since everything is completely connected, each yeah. step is connected to every other step from the, as soon as you scale your ingredients until you pull the bread out of mm -hmm. the oven. So if you dedicate yourself to focusing on the effects of your actions, you build up a gradual body of knowledge about right. the way the bread reacts. Mm -hmm. We talked about this a little bit on the, on the first session. And then gradually your hands know, you, all you have to do is go like that and you'll know exactly where the bread is and what it needs. Yeah. Right? Never underestimate the immense sensitivity of the human hand. So if I said, oh, Gazina, would you bring me a sheet of paper? And you went over and you got some paper and you brought it back. You said, oh, no, that's two sheets. Why? Because your hand can tell the difference right. between one piece and two pieces of paper. We're that sensitive. And with bread, the more you do it, the more that body of knowledge, hand knowledge, yeah. um, is developed. And it just becomes more and more joyous, really. So I'm going to flour these banneton. Once again, if we didn't have these, not a problem. Simply use a bowl with a tea towel, a cotton towel. And you would flour that as well? Yep, you yeah. would. Yep. And if you, if you were not with us for our first session, I know everyone who wasn't is looking at his sieve and saying, I want one too. <laughs> you have to go and, see Bea like, in Madrid. <laughs> yes, you got in Madrid, very, a very special woman who makes them. They're bespoke, essentially. You cannot have one. <laughs> Even though it, I wonder if you, you know, Delorin in, in Paris. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, they have the, the drum sieves, but I've never seen one that small. I never had either, and I think when she saw me standing in front of her display with my eyes wide open, she said, oh, would it's, you like one of these? I it said, is, how, well, how did you I guess? Mean, aside, as I've said this before, that it is just stinking adorable, it's very useful. Yeah. I mean, you're pinpointing exactly where the flower's going. And it's a very fine sieve, too. Okay, so one oval and three round. So another thing to stress is that, you know, bakers have different ways of doing things. There's not just one way to make a round loaf. There's not just one way to make an oval loaf. On the first week, didn't I? No, I, no, I was going to do it last week, but I wasn't here. But um, I was going to show you when I first worked in Germany in 1977. It was in Heilbronn, mm -hmm. north of Stuttgart. And there were, it was a 
big bakery. They had 12 steam-injected wood-burning ovens. They were building six more. They had a tunnel oven where you put the bread in at one end and it's okay. taken by <laughs> chains and it comes out done on the other. So great. That was just the bread department. Then yeah. they had the pastry department. But we didn't have enough bench space to do the rolls um, because we were doing thousands and thousands of rolls every day. So how did we do our rolls? You are kidding me. No, everybody had these little... <laughs> It worked. It worked. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So anyway, so I'll show you a method for making an oval loaf. Pat out the gases, which aren't very visible. Fold over a bit here. I'm going to come in just about an inch with those shoulders. Now I fold here, and then we did this on the first week. My thumbs are going to stay at the very top. I roll them towards me. I push away. Again, keep your fingers dry. Roll towards and push away. It looks very staccato, but when you're actually doing it, it's a very legato type yeah. of motion. And you just keep walking down to the end. And then when you get to the end, just fashion it into a you know reasonably harmonious shape. That's all there is to it. I love that method of shaping an oval loaf because it's like this endless massage for your fingers. And it's going um, seam side up, correct? Seams are up so that you get the pretty pad under the basket. If the dough is particularly sticky, before you put it in the basket, you'll want to dry the surface right. to make it release easier. Mm -hmm. For round loaf, same stuff. Let's see what we got. I think they look pretty good. We'll give it two more. So for the round loaf, I'm going to start the way I did the pre-shape, where I pick it up and roll it and tuck it. And then when I get to, the, to almost a rounded shape, then I'm going to place my hands around the loaf. This will re remain on the bench the whole time. My thumbs will overlap. And then I will rotate the loaf so that the north pole more or less stays north. You can hear my fingers because they're staying on the bench. And the goal is to make a round, tight, seamless ball. Again, if it's ripped, I've either been too much exertion or my fingers weren't dry. So that's more or less how you want it to look. I'll do, t I'll do two more that way. So. Pat, fold, seam is horizontal, now it's vertical, tuck, 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 and now here's that. You want to try to let your upper body do the work. In other words, I don't want my wrists to be taking all the burden. You want to use the strength of your upper body so that you can always feel like you're not overexerting yourself. So that's, that's it. These are rolling very easily because they're fairly cold. And so they're not real gassy. And how much rise would you expect from these? Um, because I think it can be a little confusing that this versus uh, commercial yeast. The commercial yeast will have quite a... Much quicker. A much quicker. Yeah. And, and this will take a bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to say is that, you know, we're in an, an interesting new era of bread making. Um, we made, on the first week, it was 100% white flour. Last week, when I wasn't here, but the oatmeal bread was like 85 or 90% white flour, and then the rest was whole wheat. This week, we've got, well, 10% or so of rye flour. <clears throat> There are, there's a trend, there's a kind of a little cult of anti-white in the country now, where if it's not 100% whole grain, then it's not good bread, or that's going to be good enough. It didn't open that well, but we're going to have to put it out there anyway. And this one... We'll give that a couple more. 
we don't know how long this series of classes is going to go on, but we're pretty much committed to doing it as long as people are in isolation, right? Absolutely. This and is at some point we might do 100% whole wheat bread. I'd love to. At some I think point we, we might do 100% rye bread. I'd yes, love please. to. Um, <laughs> the German girl says, yes, I would like a rye very much. <laughs> but I want to be open to as many different possibilities as, as I can. I don't want to restrict myself and say it has to be whole grain. And there's a couple of interesting facts. One is that we love that term boulanger, mm -hmm. the ball maker, you know, that lovely French term, the boulanger. Well, they weren't called boulanger until the end of the 12th century. Prior to that, they were called the talmelier. And the root really? for talmelier is tamisé, which means to sift, oh. because bakers sifted their own flour. Oh, and the it's mill a tammy. Do it, yeah. Right? And depending upon the customer's money, they would either get the finest sifting or the coarsest sifting. Uh, but basically, people didn't want whole wheat bread. Right. Even yes. though, back then, people were getting the majority of their calories from bread, from they bread. still wanted it sifted. So, I love whole grains, but I don't want to just say no white. I love the unimpeded flavor of the endosperm when I eat a baguette, where there's no sourness yeah. to interfere, there's no bran or germ. Uh, I, I am um, unabashedly a lover of bread in all its forms. Um, the spongy, spongy milk breads that sure. are all white, that remind me of the bread I didn't get as a child. <laughs> <laughs> to, one, to rye, to the rye that is so dense that you could leaven it to kingdom come and it would still be this dense puck of a loaf which is what my family will always have when I go visit them and they're rather large loaves and it'll last them for a week or so and they have a bread slicer just for it and for broadside uh, for dinner you'll have yeah. your allotment yeah. you'll like take off a decent amount and then you'll have your of course your meats and your cheeses to go along with it sure so we get another now we get we'll to play do some the more. second series of folds again if we follow the formula, I would have given it more kneading at the initial time and then waited 50 minutes. But since our hour is just about up, we're going to do this now. So it's the same method. Point the thumbs. And you can see the development after oh, even yeah. a few wax, which yeah. is just so lovely. And it feels good. It's a really nice, peaceful motion. Thank you for pulling that bread. Okay. All right, that's still not fermented yet. It's only an hour old, so will you keep this and bake Oh, yes. Bake it? I, I will be its babysitter. Good. <laughs> then maybe try shaping and retarding the loaves. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I will do that. So it's different from this method. Yeah. By the way, if you do this method where you retard the dough in bulk and then shape like we did now, you don't want to retard these again overnight. Correct. Because the dough will be overaged. So either do it this way or the way that these were done where I shaped these last night and refrigerated them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then next week... Oh my goodness, we're going to make a big turn, aren't we? <laughs> we are. Well, today was sour. Next week we're going to be sweet. So, Jeffrey, you're going to make challah. We're going to make challah. And you're going to do some braiding. We'll do some braiding. And I will do a sweet, quick recipe, um, just to mix it up a little. And then I do think it would be fun in the future to do some whole grains. Oh, absolutely. We're going absolutely. to do soakers. We're going to, do, we're going to cover the whole gamut. Because I think by the time next week is over, and I'm, you know, I think right now with everyone at home, you know, mischief has come down. There's not as much crime, but I think somebody's breaking into the house, a tailor, and making my pants smaller. <laughs> I think it might be happening to everyone. So I think whole grains, things that kind yeah. of nourish us in a different way, I think in the future will be wonderful. But we're here. Definitely. We're here as long as you need us. That I know that, and just so you know, today's Friday. That's how I know it's Friday, because I know we're doing this on Fridays, otherwise I wouldn't know what day it was. But this isn't easy for 
any of us. But I find joy in doing this with you, Jeffrey. And I really look forward to it and knowing that we can help some people at home who are finding comfort in this. And I think this is a way that they will continue finding comfort rather than frustration. I think that's really well put. Yeah. And my only hope is that um, <clears throat> if this goes on for like a really long time, I just hope that your many fans of yours on social media don't leave en masse when they see me walk in with a ponytail. <laughs> now you have promised us. <laughs> now you have promised us that a ponytail is in our future. So next week, holla. holla. We'll be here. We'll be a little sweeter. But we will continue answering your questions if you have them after this is over. The lovely people at King Arthur are so good about responding to your baking needs. And I had such a nice time. What Thank a you, nice Jeffrey. hour. Such a nice hour. And I wish you, we had smell vision because that smells amazing. smell vision <laughs> so, Great. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. And there'll be a new joke next week. Yeah. Oh, new joke <laughs> next week. Stay tuned. So thanks, everyone. It was yeah, a pleasure thanks, baking with you from afar. Bye-bye.